question. So you don't work in the right? So are they still measuring? Are they continuing on with measuring now? Dave's still there. He's a volunteer. I thought you said that you didn't work that you is that the kind of joke? I just paid for it. Uh-huh, okay. So you're still measuring everyone? Okay, nice. You've got a pretty high request, I think? As you know, my successes are coming up. Oh, yeah, your successes. I'm not ready to give up the process. Yeah, it was a two-year paper, actually. How'd you connect with Dave? Uh, so, yeah, I guess uh, I did my graduate work at the Museum, so John Bates here is my uh, PhD oh, okay. advisor. So I was here for six years and uh, studying other things, um, but yeah, I got distracted by all the state. I was thinking, as you were saying, that the wind length is getting longer and they're traveling further distances because it was occurring to me, as you said. When traveling for the distances, I thought that should alter the data as far as what we see in Chicago at a specific date. You know, but if that isn't shifting so much, then we must be flying. Uh, that is a, a great point. Uh, it's something, yeah, we, we can't really deal with at the moment. Like, we, that could be happening, so we could be sampling. The, were you one of the reviewers of our paper? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we could be sampling different parts of the population every year. Um, I think we're probably every year, I think uh, a similar representation of the population is probably coming through over time. And if there's change that's probably happening in that population as opposed to what is, happens to be flying through Chicago, but yeah. Could you do that with the isotopes? Maybe, yeah. yeah. So you're speaking about globalization. Are you calling the globalization refers to the city or are you saying that they globalized the whole time in that situation or like we went out into the country? Um, uh, just how, when do they produce those localizations? Mm -hmm. So uh, referring, in this case, I was referring specifically to when they're migrating at night. So only when they're migrating. But can um, the environment or just yeah, yeah, and so they probably call them more in the cities because there are more lights, but yeah, you can go, yeah, if you've never done it, go out somewhere in the country in uh, mid-September uh, mid -September, uh, where it's dark and quiet uh, and predict to be good bird migration and, and, and listen because uh, you'll hear these birds there, they're overhead. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the ones that weren't there are, we think don't call, probably don't call at night. Uh, Does bright moonlight affect you? Uh, that? Uh, I don't know. So uh, that someone else asked me about that recently and realized that uh, I don't know. Why don't they all, if they're attracted to lights, why don't all the birds fly towards the moon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. Maybe it's something you can't find. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the answer is gravity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's other scientists are starting to think about a million different topics related to this, but sort of just-in-time information where you can uh, sort of measure the concentrations of the birds that are the, at greatest risk in these kind of cities. Like you could tell us that you know, in 24 hours, an unprecedented amount will be here, and while we can't do anything about removing the buildings, we can right. triage them around the ground. Yeah, where you could, I mean, with bird gas, even what, with what is already present now, and I, I don't know to uh, what extent you're using it, but um, there already is a to kind of predict, uh, at least you know, some of the time, uh, when there ought to be a lot of migration. And so if you have good contacts with building managers, for example, who aren't willing to turn their lights off uh, all the time at night, uh, there might be some leverage to say, hey, we're going to let you know. Uh, when we think it's really important to turn the lights up and you can turn them off then, yeah. And I think that's that's happening in some cities. Yeah. And has that happened at McCormick Place with so many fatalities? Right, well, I know Dave can speak to that better than me. McCormick Place, when we first started checking, the lights were on pretty much 24-7. And yeah. it's an interesting building because of the expositions there sometimes going in. The turnover is like, 
I mean, can't be done in the dark. But they do have curtains now that they didn't have. And there are probably, this, there's a lot more nights where lights are off than not on. So that the number of casualties is massively lower than it used to be. I mean, in the old days, in the early days when we were first feeling our way with it, there were years where there were 2,000 birds a year at the one building. And that's, you know, not as much as it has been in a year, but a significant portion of what's been done. But it's much, much reduced now. And some, I don't know how much of it is, is um, in response to our data that's been presented, how much is because it saves money to turn lights off. I know, but it, it's, it, it's not, it's still one of the worst buildings, but it, it's getting better. And, and I'm not as much of an activist as some of you, but it, we're working at it. Yeah, a question, just an observation that um, we have a lot of us been using bird cats before, you know, each night to see is tomorrow going to be a busy day downtown or not. Yeah. And calling out the troops if we think it's going to be a heavy migration. And in fact, bird cats shows that it was a heavy migration, but it always doesn't bear out that yeah. there were a lot of fatalities right. on the ground where we're monitoring. So we, we don't really understand why are they flying over. Yeah, no, that. Um, you no, know they're flying because yeah. Birdcast says they are. So that's a good, yeah. So I, I, one of the things we're hoping to do with the McCormick data is um, take a closer look at, since we, so the light, do you understand when there are a lot of collisions, you have to know what, how much light there was because it's such a strong force. Okay. Um, and so there are, McCormick places maybe the only building where we have that information. So basically, putting the light data into this big predictive model that predicts collisions. And with that light data, then you can control for um, the artificial light, and then start asking about more detailed climatic things, like, well, was it the clouds? Mm -hmm. Was it the wind coming off the lake? Because BirdCast isn't going to tell you the, I mean, as you know, the weather in Chicago can be uh, localized. So uh, it's not going to tell you, you know, there, there could be things, very lo local patterns that um, would be missed in more regional estimates. So, yeah, so the, the folks who built that tool um, have the hardware data on the tool. Do something interesting. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, the data from uh, Willowbrook, uh, even though it'd be small by comparison, is that getting added in? Or do you think uh, it yeah, so uh, <laughs> this was an interesting question that actually came up uh, recently. Uh, are birds that are found alive, so we're looking at the birds that are either found dead or died right after they're found, basically, rather than things that go to Willowbrook or other rehabilitation centers. So, like for the flight calls, maybe rear guys are just really tough. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, actually, in the last week, I've been looking at the Willowbrook data. I don't think uh, the rear guys just are. Wearing or something, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it certainly would um, add a lot of information because I know a lot of them go, go through this, but um, at the same time, we have a lot of data. So. Yeah. Yes. Hi, do you have a uh, potential development happening in Jackson Park? Chicagoans probably know them. Um, uh, they intend to put up a 20 plus story tower, parking garages, security lights, basically tear up 20 acres of Jackson Park, which is right on the Mississippi Flyway. How is this going to affect the bird populations in Chicago? Well, I think, uh, I mean, you could uh, feel this, but I would think it'd be that is some of these other buildings, basically. Yeah. And, uh, right. I mean, one thing, one thing I'll say from other, so uh, Chicago is a bit, bit unique in the sense there's such a high density of bird killing buildings. Um, but in other places where you can spend a little more time looking at um, individual buildings, um, people have noticed things like how much landscaping is outside the building and how does that predict uh, collisions and yeah, I mean somewhere where Jack, like Jackson Park, if there's truly a building in the middle, in an island of forested habitat, that could actually be. Mm -hmm. 
one thing about, I mean, we're talking about Obama Center, right? Yeah. Um, that we've sort of been assured that the building itself will not be an all glass structure that, you know, is particularly dangerous. And if, in, if, uh, if this ordinance that Annette was mentioning is actually passed quickly, they will have to adhere to the guidelines of that as well. Um, but um, as much as I wish the Obama Center were somewhere else, we're counting on oversight being there to keep the building, individual buildings from being the kinds of killers that some of the others are. And you're concerned about people like moving yards or we're just going to have skyscrapers along the Chicago yeah. Route, which is another yeah. habitat we've got a quarter we're yeah. right, using. So there's a lot of concern in, in monitoring to see that uh, they use bird safe uh, design for those kind of buildings because they, they also will be in the place where the birds are. So right. that is a concern. And, yeah, it's the building, but it's also the additional light. It's the, you know, it's the loss of habitat, it's the loss of places for birds to rest overnight and things like that. You're just, you're just tearing up and putting this everywhere. So one thing that's a challenge, I was at a <coughs> symposium in Cleveland last week that was about sorry, collisions and one thing that's a challenge everywhere is uh, um, ironically one of the, the best things that can be done to improve the energy efficiency of a building is to use a ton of reflective glass. Um, and so there's uh, tension between having office buildings that have life actually coming in uh, to make people happy, that uh, preserve energy and are, uh, and are you know, climate friendly versus <laughs> killing the birds. And so this is a balance that uh, yeah, we just have to work out uh, either through glass that uh, has some kind of treatment that will reduce bird collisions. Um, or finding some happy medium. But that's part of the reason we're seeing so many all glass buildings. Mm -hmm. um, one of your issues is the different cities listed in Chicago coming out number one in collisions. I noticed that New York was listed down about six or seven, something like that. So, yeah, so that was. Um, um, and there actually, there was not a collision data in that. It was about the, basically the potential exposure. And the reason that Chicago, so the first, the highest city was Chicago and then Houston, I think. Um, and I think the reason they're up there compared to New York uh, probably has more to do with the mass amount of bird migration um, coming through directly, <laughs> basically, uh, compared to New York. Um, yeah, that's what I was wondering. There were just fewer birds going through New York than through Chicago. Probably. And that'd be my guess. Yeah. Can I have a similar question about New York? Um, I heard that San Francisco and New York both have programs, monitoring programs. Um, do you know if they have like a similar relationship with museums and student collections? Uh, in San Francisco? Or, well, San Francisco or the. Uh, yeah, in New York. Uh, yeah, at, um, certainly the American Museum of Natural History uh, is, is well set up to take in a lot of dead birds. So. Um, I don't know. Well, no one's had days, but um, <laughs> they, they, they do, or and Mary, but they, they do the best they can. So, yeah. And sometimes, um, like in Michigan now, like uh, um, where I'm in charge of the collection there, we, um, we can kind of handle the birds we get locally, so sometimes we take some from other places too. Yeah. John? <laughs> so, what do you think about the overall condition of the birds that are coming through? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of how healthy they are. And, yeah, do you uh, see a way to, to get at that? Maybe? Well, um, yeah, I mean, one of the big questions in all of this is, is there some bias associated with um, looking at birds that die when they hit buildings? Um, and, you know, we could do something like, uh, like Black Swamp Bird Observatory in Ohio, in Northwestern Ohio, has been banning birds for um, decades now, and so they have tons of data on many of these same species that just caught, get caught in mist nets. Um, I have no idea if the quality of the data is there to, to make some kind of comparison. I was just wondering whether you know, there's some way to analyze mass yeah. in a way that actually begins to get at that. So the real interesting thing I saw at the symposium last week is someone was putting uh, 
geolocating or um, radio tags on birds that hit buildings and recover uh, to try and find out well what happens to all these birds get released from rehab centers because they were severely concussed. You know, they they are not uh, exactly in fantastic shape, um, and they had an oven bird um, that flew all the way to Churchill, Manitoba. Um, on a trip are still there. Yeah, so which is uh, hundreds of miles out of where oven bird ought to be, and this was after it hit a building. Um, so maybe that oven bird was kind of lost in the first place, but maybe. Um, I, I would not be surprised if, um, this is total speculation, I would not be surprised if some of the time when we see birds that spend all winter in Chicago that shouldn't, like oven birds or other warblers, um, that there's some of the birds that have been um, that have hit mm -hmm. uh, and that they're just uh, not truly recovering. But, uh, it was picked up by an arctic time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell the age of the bird? Uh, to a point, yeah, so you can tell if it's uh, in most cases, if it's uh, a year old, uh, sometimes two years old, after after three years, um, I think it's like So there'd be after a year. Can try for age. A little bit, yeah. So we can uh, we can at least control if they're born yeah. that year or not. Yeah, which is important. Well, one last question: So is the banding of the libraries, the stuff that you study the libraries, would be valuable with that? The, uh, the, uh, so banding stations that have been operating for a long time have actually have more data. They have, uh, they've banned hundreds of thousands of birds over this, this time period. The problem is, uh, and this is no knock on their effort, but all those birds have been measured by different people. Yeah. Uh, and so to have consistency of measurements is actually difficult. Uh, it's also harder to measure a bird that's alive. <laughs> it's harder to measure them using a specimen when it's dried. Uh, the easiest way measure a bird is plowing um, off the freezer and all. <laughs> uh, so, so I think um, there have been other studies published on body size change through time from banding stations, but uh, there's a lot, there's just a lot more variation. And you're talking about the versus a millimeter, right? Very tiny, yeah. 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 Well, thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you.